Welcome to Morial TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash. Jacob, social justice is uh, becoming an increasingly familiar term, especially within evangelicalism or the broader evangelical spectrum. Uh, there is seems to be a wave of uh, cultural Marxism infiltrating the church, uh, things like intersectionality and critical race theory and so forth. Uh, what are your general thoughts on, on, this, on this topic? You know, there's nothing new under the sun, but let's begin at the beginning. What does God say about social injustice, particularly in the New Testament? In the New Testament, you had a situation where with the apostolic church, 25% of the population in the Greco-Roman world were slave. Many of them mistreated. There were political liberation movements that took place historically, such as most famously with, with Spartacus and others. How did the apostles handle bringing the gospel into this world where 25% of the population were slaves. Let's not forget that from Corinth also came gladiators, slaughtering people as public entertainment, widespread temple prostitution, the high rose camels, all manner of social evils, immorality, and injustices, but particularly slavery. The gospel came from the Jews, and the Jews, at least if the Torah was followed and complied with, did not allow slavery. They only allowed indenturism to the year of Jubilee. People could be bond slaves, but even the bond slaves had rights. Even the animals had rights under the Torah. The Torah was quite progressive, more progressive than the code of Hammurabi or any other legal code from the ancient world, much more progressive in terms of its social and sociological impact, but it was all predicated on Israel's relationship with God, with monotheism, having the one true God, having his word and having his law. Now, how do you bring that on the back of the gospel into a Greco-Roman world that was economically dependent upon slavery? Other things had happened in the first century. We know this from such classics, Latin classics, as um, Cicero's Republic and Seneca's De Clementia, when Rome went from being, in, old, in ancient terms, of democracy into an imperial dictatorship. Same time, this injustices, the slavery. It was a very complicated environment in which to be a Christian with a message of hope, salvation, and Jesus. How do you combat these social evils? If the apostles campaigned politically against these social evils, they would have been seen as stirring up another Spartacus revolt. In Greek mythologies, Hercules was a god-man. His father was Zeus, a corruption of Theos, whom the Romans identified with the planet Jupiter, and his mother was human. Now, the Greco-Roman world would have reinterpreted or misunderstood Jesus in terms of a Hercules, a liberation figure from religious mythology of Greece, or a political figure like Spartacus. It would have increased persecution that was there anyway and was going to get worse. What was the weapon against the injustices of the Greco-Roman world. It was the gospel of Jesus. Paul said, if you're able to get free, get free. But he understood the socioeconomic realities, that if some slaves were fully liberated, they'd have no means of survival. So Paul says, these people are your brothers. Treat them like brothers, not as possessions. The focus of the New Testament was the gospel was the weapon against social evil and injustice. As people got saved and they were convicted of their sin by the Holy Spirit and they took on the teachings of Jesus, treat others the way you want others to treat them or to treat you, 
do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. Things of this nature. The apostles saw a second birth and they saw the dissemination of the gospel as the means to transform society because it would be God transforming it, not people, not social reformers, not political means. They believed positive social and political change would come in response to Judeo-Christian values being taken on by the social mainstream in response to enough people becoming Christians of all social categories, slaves, free men, Roman citizens, the aristocracy, even the Senate. There were people we know in the imperial courts who were Christians. One of the early martyrs of the church, Priscilla, uh, ironically, <laughs> almost, her remains were taken from the catacombs in Rome to a cathedral in Los Angeles where her remains are interred, her bones are. But she was a, a Roman noblewoman who was martyred for her faith. The gospel was seen as the means to transform society. What Satan has always tried to do is to misuse the gospel by corrupting it into some kind of a political crusade, thinking that you can change the world by politics. You can only change the world by changing people spiritually transforming them spiritually. When they become new creations and have a new spirit, then they think differently, the renewal of your mind, as the New Testament puts it, and then society will change. You will see economic reforms, political reforms, etc. John Wesley knew this. He was the master at orchestrating it. He knew as the gospel permeated British society at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, social injustice would disappear. George Whitfield was much the same. Later on, we had other people, such as Dr. Bernardo in Britain, or the founder of the Salvation Army, William Booth. They understood the same thing. The gospel was the basis of social transformation. Unless people have a new heart, a new spirit, unless they are a new creation, it doesn't matter what takes place legally or politically beyond the limited point. It's not going to change anything because it's not going to change the heart of man. Satan has always tried to undermine this in various ways. Let's understand some of the more negative examples as how this has come about. A number of people who are abolitionists in the northern states and even some of the southern states in the United States who organized the Underground Railroads were Christians. The evangelist D.L. Moody was an opponent of slavery. Uh, ironically, his music minister, who, who later got saved, Ira Sankey, had been in the Confederate Army. So you had a Yankee and a Confederate ministering together for Jesus. They were like the, the George Beverly Shea and, and, and Billy Graham of their era, the music minister and the, and the preacher. Uh, it was very different then. They understood there had to be an exposition of God's word and a presenting of the gospel. You just couldn't use music. You couldn't make the music alone the focus. Well, what's happening today with Hillsong and things like this? The music becomes the focus and worship becomes mutated into entertainment. There were people who historically got it right because they were scriptural, but today we're getting it wrong. Going back to the American Civil War, one of the persons who got it wrong was a lay preacher from Kansas, vehement opponent of slavery called John Brown. He saw what was going to happen and he tried a helter-skelter effect. As, as Charlie Manson would interpret the Beatles song later on, where there'd be an uprising of black slaves against the injustices of slavery, and we would arm the slaves and overthrow the system. But he made this, or attempted to make this, a Christian crusade. When he shot it out with the federal authorities in, in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, 
at that time part of Virginia. Black slaves were killed in it. He achieved nothing. He only helped push the country closer to the Civil War and a bloody conflict. Slavery had already ended in Brazil, in the Caribbean, and was ending in America. It would have been wonderful had it been able to end without a bloody conflict that took one out of eight American men as casualties. Would have been wonderful. It was right for Christians to oppose it, but some of them opposed it in the wrong way. John Brown being one of them. Well, this is happening today. Now, what's really ironic is in the history of the United States, it was primarily Calvinists who were pro-slavery. John Wesley opposed slavery. He was instrumental in its abolition in the British Empire, as was the author of, sorry, the composer of Amazing Grace, John Newton. They were Wesleyan Arminians. They opposed slavery. It was the Calvinists who supported it. Even a great evangelist like George Whitfield owned black slaves. He actually owned black slaves. I'm not saying he mistreated them. I'm just saying that he owned them. He was a slave owner. Now, he was a great preacher, and he, he, he was known for his love of blacks, but he had no problem with the institution of slavery per se. Forgetting what the New Testament said, it's better to be free. We're free in the Lord. Moving on and looking at this, however, we saw what happened. It was the Calvinists who were the slave owners. It was the non-Calvinist evangelicals who opposed it. This is why you have Southern Methodists and you have Methodists. It's why you have Southern Baptists and Baptists. They split over the issue of slavery. Strange thing that the very church tradition of Calvinism that got it wrong with slavery is now getting it wrong once again with social injustice. Calvinism. Calvinism always gets it wrong. Going right back to Geneva, going back to Salem, Massachusetts. When has Calvinism not gotten it wrong? What they did with the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa under apartheid, what they did in the plantation period in Ireland, Calvinism has always gone hand in hand with social injustice. The Calvinistic distortion of the gospel. It's a historical fact. It's a historical indictment of it. Now, I'm not saying all Calvinists were bad or malintentioned, but I am saying it is their legacy. It is their heritage. So now they're addressing the issue of social injustice, but they're not addressing it scripturally. Tim Keller and these people who are under his umbrella, including people like Al Mohler, who have joined this camp, people you would think would know better. Al Mohler had at one time been a conservative. Uh, other people, uh, David Platt and uh, certainly John Piper, why are they aligning themselves with a person like Tim Keller? Look at what Romans chapter one says about homosexuality and compare that to what Tim Keller says about homosexuality. Uh, Mark Deaver being another one. Now, this is a sinister game. Let me explain this as carefully as I can. Satan has more than one time deceived well-intentioned Christians into fighting social evils by trying to fight the evils politically in lieu of preaching the gospel of salvation and making that the focus. To preach the gospel of salvation, sin must be called sin, including homosexuality. But that's not what's happening now. It's not what's happening at all. To explain this, we have to understand there's nothing new under the sun, nothing. 
In the 1960s, you had a Roman Catholic version of liberation theology led by such figures as Bonino and Sobrino. They were essentially communistic Roman Catholics in Latin America fighting the injustices of the juntas who controlled most of Latin America. Many of them lead ideologically towards people like Che Guevara, even towards Castro, who persecuted evangelicals. Um, what you see in, with Maduro and Victor Chavez in, in Venezuela, the mess today, well, they were Catholic clergy who leaned towards those people. This divided the Roman Catholic Church in Latin America. It was the growth of Pentecostalism that pushed this pseudo-Christian path to social transformation back. It was the explosive growth of Pentecostalism, essentially, or evangelicism generally, but particularly Pentecostals, that saw an exflux of people out of the Catholic Church into evangelical Pentecostal churches who were anti-communist. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, it, in South Africa, there was the liberal Protestant version of it with Desmond Tutu. Desmond Tutu, however, was not simply against apartheid. He wanted to ordain lesbian priestesses into the Anglican communion as clergy. Now, you have to understand most black Anglicans in Africa are evangelical. They don't look to Desmond Tutu as their leader. They look to the evangelical conservative archbishop of Lagos, Nigeria, as their leader, who does not agree with homosexuality and who left the Anglican communion of Lambeth and formed an independent African Anglican movement over that very issue. Desmond Tutu is a clear example of intersectionality. I'm black, I'm oppressed, but homosexuals are also impressed. Multi stratas. Multi layers, these things intersect. Be a classic example of it. Well, is a man who wanted to ordain lesbian priestesses a real example of Christianity? No, he's not. Apartheid ended in South Africa. The ANC came to power with his Episcopal blessings. But South Africa has replaced one evil with another. Black unemployment has more than doubled since the end of apartheid. Black infant mortality has gone through the roof. Black longevity has declined rapidly. The corruption, the economic decline of South Africa, and the unspeakable crime, most of it, but not all of it by any means, black on black. It's a country that replaced one evil with a worse one. The average black person in terms of economic position, longevity, infant mortality, the average black in South Africa is worse off now than they were under apartheid. And I was against apartheid. I thought it was unjust and bigoted. But you had liberation theology. Look what it produced in South Africa. Look what it produced with John Brown and Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. It's always been like that. It is a trick and a lie. Well, let's look at this even further. Without second birth, you're not gonna see any real social transformation. Real social change will only come about when Judeo-Christian biblical principles are applied to a society. One of the phenomena you will find in intersectionality in the world, it exists in the secular world, but now it is coming into the church under the tutelage of Tim Keller and co, the Calvinists. One of the features of it is it is ecumenical and it is into faith. They'll work with Islamic groups. The first countries in the world to abolish slavery were Christian. I wish I could tell you 
that the last countries to abolish it were Islamic, but I can't because they haven't abolished it yet. In Sudan, in Chad, in Niger, there's still black African slaves owned by wealthy Afro-Arab Muslims. In the Persian Gulf countries, in Saudi Arabia, you have an economic slavery. They call it employment contracts, buying underage girls in Ethiopia or impoverished Islamic countries in black Africa, give the parents $200 or, or from India or Pakistan and fly them to harems in the Arabian Peninsula, paid for with petrol dollars. These things exist. Let's understand the injustices of slavery in the United States. They make much capital of this with intersectionality. Of the transatlantic slave trade, only 6% of those slaves came to the southern United States. 94% went to South America, countries like Brazil, and the West Indies and the Caribbean. The United States did not have as many slaves as those other countries. Not only that, but beginning with the fourth American president, I'm sorry, the fifth American president, James Monroe, the United States began to act against slavery, outlawing the slave trade. So the slaves in the United States had to be born there. Now they were bred with studs and things like this and house slaves and field slaves, it was terrible. But the US Navy interdicted slave ships transporting black slaves across the Atlantic and repatriated those slaves to Liberia. Liberia was founded in part for that purpose by the United States as a place to free slaves. It began early. Yet we hear a great deal about the history of slavery in the United States and the Confederacy. The slave trade in East Africa was far bigger than the slave trade in West Africa. The slave trade in East Africa on the Indian Ocean, as opposed to the Atlantic Ocean, involved the sale of slaves to the Arab Muslim Middle East. Only why don't you find a large amount of black people living in the Arabian Peninsula? It is because upon enslavement and arrival in Arabia, it was mandatory that all male slaves be emasculated. They castrated them. While the New Testament and the Old Testament obviously did not favor slavery, God did not allow it. The year of Jubilee, the bond servants had to go free. The people were the Lord's. The New Testament took a very negative view. In Islam, in the Quran, you don't have anything like that. It exists to this day in the Islamic world, yet you see black people going to Louis Farrakhan as some kind of a liberator. It's ridiculous. It's the religion of black enslavement. Nonetheless, You'll see these social justice evangelical warriors caught up in intersectionality. Now remember, intersectionality was purely, sex, uh, purely socio-political. It was purely socio-political that infiltrated the church. It is simply a reinvented liberation theology that has always been around from the time of John Brown and earlier. Desmond Tutu, it's always been there. It's just a reinvented liberation theology, drawing on the socio-political designs of intersectionality.
a sociological model based on identity politics. That's what it is. That's all it is. But it's not new. People have attempted it. Christians have attempted it. And it's always failed. And it will fail now, but what it does is refocuses people away from what will work, the second birth, the preaching of the gospel. Of course, he's an outstanding classic example, but we think of John Newton, captain of a slave ship. His life was saved in a shipwreck, and he had a second birth experience, devoted the rest of his life to composing Christian hymns like Amazing Grace, to preaching the gospel, and demanding the abolition of slavery. But the gospel was his platform. Well, give me a John Newton, give me a John Wesley, but please keep your John Browns. <laughs> keep your Desmond Tutus and keep your Tim Kellers and David Platts. The history of the church shows the havoc that those people wreck. But there is another dimension to this. Remember, in my book, Shadows of the Beast, we explain it in considerable depth. Judas Iscariot and the Antichrist are both the son of perdition. When you see something about Judas Iscariot, the Holy Spirit is telling us something about the Antichrist to come. He was a deceiver and a successful one. Only Jesus knew who he was up to the Last Supper. Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? They didn't know. The chief way he masqueraded his agenda and his identity was pretending to care about the poor. Lord, could this not have been sold and given to the poor? Now you read that synoptically. It was initiated by Judas, but most of the apostles agreed with them. They got caught up in agreeing with them. If you read it in the synoptic accounts, read it in all the gospels. It's in three of them. The Antichrist is going to use the cause of social justice to advance his religio-political agenda and deceive Christians. There's more to Tim Keller than what you see. There's more to his collaborators than what you see. Much more. It is a mark of the last days. Intersectionality is simply a socio-political model of the left. That's not going to transform society. Show me one place that embraced those values. Now, I'm speaking as a former socialist. In my youth, in the 1960s, I was extremely left-wing. Show me one place it worked that hasn't ended up like Venezuela or like Cuba. Suppression of human rights, impoverished people, and replacing one power elite and privileged class with another based on the apartheid of the party, of the Politburo, and their vacillating underlings. This was Leninism. It's exactly what happened. They were worse than the czars. They were worse. Fidel Castro was worse than Batista. Worse. The Contras in Central America, they were worse than the Hunters. Worse. No. Only Christ can change a society because only Christ can change a person. John Wesley knew that. William Booth knew that. Dr. Bernardo knew that. And we have to know that. When I see people who know this stuff is wrong, 
and I want to applaud what you did in exposing it, Joshua. When I see John MacArthur's people sharing platforms with those who are in league with Tim Keller's junta, his theocratic junta of Marxist-leaning pseudo-Christians. This is hypocrisy. It's an ugly hypocrisy. But there's something much worse. There is an anti-Christ spirit on back of it. It is exactly how the son of perdition will deceive Christians. Satan tried it before, and it nearly worked. He's trying it again, and it's working. Points to the return of Jesus. If possible, the elect will be deceived. How can you see major evangelical figures fooling around, accepting, sharing platforms with Tim Keller and his crew not to debate them? But to present the united front with them. And they know it's wrong. The hypocrisy is astounding. People like Phil Johnson, Todd Friel, they know it's wrong. They know what John Piper is doing, what David Platt is doing. Getting in bed with Tim Keller, they know it's wrong. But they do it anyway. If possible, the elect will be deceived. Well, with intersectionality, getting into the church, again, it is simply a reinvented liberation theology that's always been around. It may be using a more modern socio-political model, but it's the same old thing. Now, some ask about Martin Luther King. Let's understand certain things about Martin Luther King. Arguably the greatest orator of the English-speaking world of the 20th century. Most people don't realize his family were Republicans because the Democratic Party was the party of Jim Crow and before that slavery. Martin Luther King came under the influences of liberal theology when he went to seminary in the Northern States. So Sinianism, among other things, that is true. It is also true, however, that his greatest speech was not, I have a dream. His greatest speech was the speech he gave the night before he was assassinated by James Earl Ray. Possibly, possibly with the collusion of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, possibly. L. Patrick Gray testifying before the Senate quoted Hoover as saying, when Martin Luther King was shot dead, we finally got the SOB. Now, that doesn't prove that the FBI was involved in it, but it does raise the possibility. I don't know. But what I do know is that speech he gave the night before he was shot dead in Memphis, it was not a speech. It was not a political activist speech. It was a sermon. The highlight was when he said he'd been to the top of the mountain and his eyes had seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Those were his last public words. 
I'd like to think this crusader for social justice did revert to the Afro-American gospel tradition that he would have known so well in his youth growing up in the American South and the Bible Belt. I'd like to think that. But I also know this. He believed in God. At least nominally, the Judeo-Christian God, despite his Socinianist leanings. Communists don't believe in God. Secondly, he was a man of peace, nonviolence. He was closer in that respect to people like Mahatma Gandhi and certain other people than he was to a John Brown or than he was to the militant blacks of the time. Bearing in mind, I would have been sympathetic to the Black Panther Party and to the militant blacks of the time. I would not have had a high view of Martin Luther King to later on. I would have been sympathetic to the Black Panthers, to Bobby Seale, Huey Newton, Eldridge Cleaver, people like that. I'd change later. But he was a man of peace, a man who believed in God. He was a Baptist clergyman. He was also pro-Zionist, and he, and he equated opposition to Israel and Zionism with anti-Semitism. He said it was nothing more than the current expression of anti-Semitism. Anti-Zionism equaled anti-Semitism. He wrote that and said that. And he denounced Russia and China. He knew that those communist states and powers were not democratic countries. He denounced them publicly. I think his legacy has been hijacked and misrepresented, ironically, by Christians. Make of Martin Luther King what you will, but the facts stand. He was not a communist. He was outspokenly anti-communist, at least in the sense of Russia and China. He was certainly a theist. He certainly believed in the Judeo-Christian scriptures, at least as a moral guide. He was a man of peace, and he was a friend of Israel and the Jews, who were strongly supportive of the civil rights movement at the time. Yeah, his legacy has been hijacked and misrepresented by these people who are making a big deal out of him and what he said and what he believed. They're not looking at the actual facts about Dr. Martin Luther King. Now again, Martin Luther King was criticized by other blacks, uh, by Ralph Admirethy, his, his successor, admitted he was a womanizer and things like this. And he was also found by the, one of the leading Afro-American academics in the United States to have plagiarized part of his thesis. I'm not saying he was a perfect man, but he's not what he's being portrayed to be. Not. He was a crusader for justice. He was a man of peace. He was a friend of Israel and the Jews. And at the end of his life, that speech he gave, that was not a speech, that was a sermon. These are the realities. This is what's really happening. This is what's going on. Christians need to be aware. There is more to intersectionality than meets the eye. It is not a new phenomena. It is simply a repackaged phenomena. But it's pointing in a very ugly direction. It's helping prepare the way for the son of perdition. It's a satanic vehicle in deceiving the elect, and it's being aided and abetted by people who will collaborate with Tim Keller and his entourage. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Jacob Prash from Morial Ministries. God bless you.